Um, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, we're going to continue our discussion on the wonderful topics from the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. Um, so we'll begin with some kirtan. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Vishnu Pesaya Mukhutale Shumate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Vishnu Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Vishnu Pesaya
So thank you all again uh, for joining us this week. Um, we'll start with some prayers. Om again to me and this year again and again she like I am. Chak shura ni tam hi na tas shri guru ven ha. Shri shitan ni no kishtam sab tam ye ni bhuta ne. So I know that I'm a hem that I'm so I'm a dancer tam. I'm a own shri kataya kishna prasaya bhuta ne. Shri ma kata bhakti tam tas tam na me ne. Namaste saraswati teve gurvani shari ni. So um, thank you all once again for an opportunity to serve as we try to present an overview of the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. This is one for Gopal Shri Prabhupada that's based on the biography of Lord Chaitanya called Chaitanya Charitamrita. Um, I pray for all your blessings to the justice with stars as we try to understand better the teachings and the past times of the Supreme Lord. And so may we deepen our love and um, our services to Today we're going to discuss the fifth chapter of the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. This is titled, How to Approach God. Um, it's the continuation of Lord Chaitanya's teachings to Sanatana Goswami. Um, so each week we'll start with the invocation, which is verse 18 of the first chapter of the Chaitanya Charitra. Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gura Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Jaya Shri Ketanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Translation is Glory to Sri Chaitanya and Nityananda Glory to Advaita Chandra And glory to all the devotees of Sri Gora Lord Chaitanya So last week Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was explaining the ways that the conditioned soul is suffering under the control of material nature and um, then he explained um, how to escape those miseries through devotional service. So today we're going to um, discuss further on the supremacy of devotional service above all other paths, or all other paths and um, the supremacy of the Supreme Lord himself, Lord Krishna. So Sri Prabhupada begins. In truth, all Vedic literature directs the human being towards the perfect stage of devotion. The paths of fruitive activity, speculative knowledge and meditation do not lead one to the perfectional stage, but the Lord is actually approachable by one who follows the process of devotional service. Therefore, all Vedic literature recommends that one accept this process. In this regard, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu quoted from the Lord's instructions to Uddhava and Srimad Bhagavatam. My dear Uddhava, neither philosophical speculation, nor meditational yoga, nor penances can give me such pleasure as devotional service practiced by the living. I am dear only to my devotees, and I can be achieved only by devotional service. Even an extremely low-born person will become free from all contamination if he takes my devotional service. So if Krishna has made this very clear 5,000 years ago, we may wonder why it is that after all this time, people still haven't taken wholeheartedly devotional service to achieve it. Um, he's made it clear in so many places that he's a supreme lord and that devotional service is the supreme process of all. But we also know that people in their um, in their uh, ego-full consciousnesses are so um, quick to deny that Krishna is the supreme lord. But in the same vein, they're also quick to deny that the Srimad Bhagavatam is the most supreme of all scriptures. Um, they don't recognize it as being um, the cream of the Vedas, as we've been told. Uh, or the Spotless Purana, as Lord Chaitanya has explained to us. Um, and they would rather just um, go along with their superficial understandings of the Vedas because um, the Vedic subject matter allows them to, to choose uh, probably any path that they may want, either um, the Vedic ritualistic processes, um, the Jnana Yoga speculation, or um, the mystic yoga process. And all of these to them, of course, seem 
equally as important, if not more important than Abu Dhabi. And um, it's interesting, of course, that we know um, Shilavi Asadev, who was tasked with writing down the Vedas, after writing all of that down and compiling the Srimad Bhagavatam, declared that the Srimad Bhagavatam, of course, contains the highest knowledge of all, being the essence of the Vedas. Uh, people are missing this, are missing um, the real message, the real conclusion of Vedic literature, although they may claim to be very well worked, well versed in the Vedas itself. Prabhupada continues, devotional service is the only perfection accepted by all Vedic literatures. Just as when a poor man receives some treasure, he becomes happy. When one attains to devotional service, his material pains are automatically vanquished. As one advances in devotional service, he attains love of Godhead, and as he advances in his love, he becomes free from all material bondage. One should not think, however, that the disappearance of poverty and the liberation from bondage are the goals of devotional service. Love of Krishna, love of God, is itself the goal, and it consists in relishing the reciprocation of loving service with the Lord. In all Vedic literatures, we find that the attainment of this loving relationship between the living entity and the Supreme Lord is the goal of devotional service. Our actual function is devotional service, and our ultimate goal is love of Godhead. Therefore, in all Vedic literatures, Krishna is the ultimate center, and through knowledge of Krishna, all problems of life are solved. So, in, the, in truth, anyone with an opinion um, on religion or the Vedas is going to offer that opinion. Um, and this is why it's so important that we just stick to what our acharyas tell us. Sri Prabhupada's um, conclusions here are not his own conclusions because of capacity. He's coming in the line of the sacred succession. This starts off with Krishna, who is the origin and the goal of the Vedas. And whatever Sri Prabhupada is um, speaking here is what Krishna would say. And what Lord Chaitanya, who is Krishna himself and who has appeared in the same disciple succession, is saying as well. And so if we learn our conclusions from Srila Prabhupada's teachings and we preach those conclusions, then we are preaching exactly the conclusions of the Vedas themselves. And that is an authority for us. The conclusion is that indirectly, directly or indirectly, all types of worship are more or less directed to the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna. The Bhagavad Gita 9.3 confirms that one who worships the demigods is in fact worshipping only Krishna because the demigods are but different parts of the body of Vishnu or Krishna, but that such worship is irregular. Srimad Bhagavatam confirms this irregularity by answering the question, what is the purpose of the different types of worship which is described in the Vedic literature? In the Vedic literature, there are various divisions. One is called the Karmakanda, which describes purely ritualistic activities. And another is the Jnana Kanda, which describes speculation on the supreme absolute truth. What then is the purpose of the ritualistic section of the Vedic literature? And what is the purpose of the Upasana Kanda, which contains different mantras or hymns for worshipping various demigods? And what is the purpose of philosophical speculation on the subject of the absolute truth? Shriman Bhagavatam replies that in actuality, all of these methods described in the Vedic literature indicate the worship of the Supreme Lord Vishnu. In other words, they are all indirect ways of worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Sacrifices contained in the ritualistic portions of this literature are meant for the satisfaction of the Supreme Lord Vishnu. Indeed, because Yajna, sacrifice, is specifically meant for satisfying Vishnu, another name for Vishnu is Yajneshwar, or the Lord of Sacrifices. So this is a good explanation as to why the Vedas is actually even talking about the rituals for the demigods, because we may wonder if all of this is irregular, as Shri Prabhupada calls it, and what is the necessity of um, so many um, tracks of literature on this in the Vedas that, that tend to uh, divert the attention of people. So we have to understand that the Vedas has been described as the manual for the world, for the universe, actually. And so it contains all kinds of, in fact, every um, conceivable aspect of knowledge, whether material or spiritual, it has to provide all knowledge for all kinds of living entities throughout the universe. And so, because different living entities are on different spiritual platforms because of their past karmas, not everybody is going to be able to take off from devotional service as soon as um, they've come into this life. 
Um, many of them will still be carrying an attachment to or an affinity for worship of the demigod or for um, mental speculation and other processes that are not directly linked to devotional service. So the Vedas caters for that because in some way, these people have to be brought to the worship of Krishna. So it starts off by um, engaging them in these different processes. But after some time, they're meant to actually come eventually to the level of devotional service. So in this paragraph specifically, we're discussing um, the ritualistic practices. And Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Bhaktaram Yagyatakram, he is the beneficiary of all these sacrifices. So anybody who is actually engaged in a, a Vedic ritual for um, a particular demigod is actually indirectly, indirectly worshipping the Lord. And if they are sincere in their practices, they're not just looking for material gain, but they're actually looking to make some advancement. Then some way, somehow, after perhaps some long practice of these Vedic rituals, they may accumulate enough um, spiritual credit that they may come in contact with Krishna consciousness. They may get the mercy of a devotee. They may hear the holy name on the street, be enchanted by the devotees and become attracted and get some prasadam or it may just stick in them that Krishna is actually the Supreme Lord through some reading or another process. And this is then the potential beginning of devotional service for them. Since neophytes are not on the transcendental level, the Vedic literature advises them to worship different types of demigods according to their situation and the different modes of material nature. The idea is that gradually such neophytes may rise to the transcendental plane and engage in the service of Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. For example, the Puranas advise the neophytes attached to flesh to eat it only after offering it to the goddess Kali. So Krishna, of course, being completely transcendental, will never accept the offerings of flesh. But uh, for persons who are attached to such things, um, Goddess Kali has uh, the duty and service to the Lord to accept it. This is the way that these persons can make advance um, if they're not able to, um, to stop their attachment to this practice. But the importance is that it was regulated by the Vedas, that um, they would, of course, just at the time of, uh, of a ritualistic sacrifice, which wouldn't happen every day, not every month, perhaps uh, yearly or few years, they would, at this only, only at this time, would they engage in animal killing, but under, of course, the specific ritualistic um, practices of the Vedas, and also with the proviso that they understand that they will, um, at some time in future, be giving up their life uh, in the same way that they expect this animal to. Uh, the benefit for the animal is that the animal gets a human form of life in its next body. So there's benefit um, for this creature. Um, but this, of course, is not the case with the wholesale slaughter that goes on um, in the modern age because animals who are killed in this way have to return to that very life that they were killed in um, to complete. It. That is the, um, the way that they progress through the species. So this is terrible, of course, for them and also terrible for the humans involved in it. This is the reason why um, all kinds of animal killing is not uh, is prohibited in this age because even the sacrifices can't be carried out successfully. And the only yagya, the only sacrifice that everyone should engage in with all their hearts is Sankirtan Yagya, which is the Lord's holy names. This is the way to bring benefit, not just to us as the chances, but to all entities, the animals, um, the birds, the trees, anyone in the vicinity who hears the holy name. Um, this is um, the explanation of a great benefit to even the lower entities that Haridas Thakur um, had been explaining in history. The philosophical sections of the Vedic hymns are intended to enable one to distinguish the Supreme Lord from Maya. After one understands the position of Maya, one can approach the Supreme Lord in pure devotional service. That is the actual purpose of philosophical speculation, and Krishna confirms this in Bhagavad Gita. Verse um, chapter 7, verse 19. After speculating for many, many births, the philosophical speculators and empiric philosophers ultimately surrender unto me, Vasudev, and accept that I am everything. It can thus be seen that all Vedic rituals and different types of worship, philosophical speculation, ultimately aim at Krishna. So thus, all these processes of worshipping the demigods and performing the Vedic rituals, um, we see, will get people eventually um, to devotional selves, they're practicing sincerely, but there's no guarantee of this. 
In the same way, Shri Prabhupada and Prashitani uh, Mahaprabhu were explaining that those who are delving into philosophy, trying to speculate as to the origin of the universe and who the supreme cause is, um, such people may, after many, many births, eventually come to the conclusion that it is Krishna. But the caveat here is many, many births. No one has that much um, luxury to we waste births trying to understand the Supreme Lord when there's a direct way to devotional service. And this is the way to approach God directly. And of course, the most efficiently. Um, so this is also the way that we can escape all the miseries that we discussed um, last week. Um, from material nature, because as soon as one takes devotional service, one is immediately under the shelter of the spiritual nature, even while they're present in the material world. So, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is now going on to explain more of the spiritual nature of Sanatha Goswami. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu then told Sanatha Goswami about Krishna's multi forms and his unlimited opulence. He also described the nature of the spiritual manifestation, the material manifestation, and the manifestation of the living entity. In addition, he informs Sanatan Goswami that the planets in the spiritual sky known as Vaikuntas and the universes of the material sky are different types of manifestations, but they are created by different energies, namely the spiritual energy and the material energy, respectively. As far as Krishna himself is concerned, he is directly situated in his spiritual energy, or specifically in his internal potency. So this is again how we approach Krishna through his spiritual potency. Um, this is the only way that Krishna is ever situated. Even when he comes to the material world, he's always situated in spiritual potency, even if it appears that he is in the material world. So um, we've heard before the explanation of the analogy given about um, an embassy, the embassy of a country. Um, South African embassy, wherever it's situated in any country of the world, is operating according to um, the rules of South Africa to the point where it could be even considered um, some extension of South Africa in that country. So when the spiritual, when, when um, Krishna comes to this material world, everything that comes with him is the spiritual world. The spiritual world itself within the material world, even if it appears ordinary uh, to someone else. So it's like a bubble, we may say, where everything within, everything um, that comes with Krishna is completely different to everything without, everything that's uh, um, that's not related to him. And this is how um, he is also completely above the laws of material nature. They don't affect him even in the material world. And the analogy that we're given in that regard is um, if they're prisoners in a jail, the prisoners are always going to have to follow the rules of the jail. But if the head of state comes to visit some official reason, um, although the head of state is in that jail physically, they're not subjected to the rules. So even though Krishna may appear to be in this world, he doesn't have to come under the rules of the material nature, the way the ordinary living who may be present at the same time or him, as him in the material world will have. In this world, there are two kinds of principles operating. One principle is the origin or shelter of everything, and all other principles are derived from this original principle. The supreme truth is the ashraya, the shelter of all manifestations. All other principles which remain under the control of the Ashraya Tattva or the, or the Absolute Truth are called Ashrita or subordinate corollaries and reactions. The purpose of the material manifestation is to give the conditioned souls a chance to become liberated and return to the Ashraya Tattva or the Absolute Truth. Since everything in the cosmic creation, which is manifested by Krishna's Vishnu expansions, is dependent on the Ashraya Tattva, the various demigods and manifestations of energy, the living entities, and all material elements are dependent on Krishna, for Krishna is the supreme truth. So this is another way of um, the Lord, is, uh, Lord Chaitanya explaining to us um, the concept of um, our dependence on the Supreme Lord. So the Lord is the ultimate shelter for all, not just entities, um, but also all material substances. So amongst these entities, we have the lowest all the way up to the highest, the demigods. All substances means everything in the material creation. So this means to us clearly that no matter how powerful a demigod may be, no matter how much they are praised within the Vedic literature and um, no matter how much worship is performed to them, all the demigods are ultimately seeking shelter at Krishna's lotus feet. 
And so what shelter can they offer to anyone else? In the same way, people who tend to see um, the Supreme as the universe and claim that um, all power, of course, rests in the universe, they don't see Krishna as a person being um, supreme, they also will have to realize at some point that this material universe is not a power on its own and it is also resting um, or taking shelter of Krishna. So if the great personalities like the demigods and this great material creation are all fully dependent on and resting on Krishna, what to speak of all these mundane personalities that people take shelter of, great leaders or um, even modern pop stars or social media personalities. Nobody can offer us shelter in any way from anything, not giving us shelter from the material miseries, um, not giving us relief and not giving us any kind of spiritual um, mercy or direction without Krishna. Lord Chaitanya then asked Sanatana Goswami to listen attentively as he described the different features of Krishna. First, the Lord informed him that Krishna, the son of Nanda, Nanda Maharaj, is the absolute supreme truth, the cause of all causes and the origin of all emanations and incarnations. Yet in Vraja or Goloka Vrindavan, he is just like a young boy. His form is eternal, full of bliss and full of knowledge absolute. He is both the shelter of everything and the proprietor as well. So the reason why people like to take shelter of this great universe or the great demigods or some great personality in this world is that they have some kind of stereotype of what a great person may seem like. And somehow this beautiful youngster with the flute from Vrindava doesn't strike them as the Supreme God. He doesn't have the archetype of what they consider um, God might be. They project, they project the experiences in the material world, which tends to see um, uh, God if he is uh, imagined as a person, as somebody older, somebody very stern, somebody um, throwing thunderbolts around and exerting their power and influence. Um, they want, it seems, to be... Um, they, they want a, a character or a personality that is suitably controlling, demonstrating um, power and perhaps creating fear in others. Um, this is a way that they feel that um, the worship, their worship will also gain them power, basically wanting to see displays of power from the Supreme Lord. And they may wonder what benefit they could get from accepting as um, Supreme, this beautiful young fruit player. And he, yet, when we think about it, the whole world is chasing this um, ideal of youth and beauty and pleasure and happiness. So if anyone had the choice to be God, wouldn't they want to be a beautiful young person enjoying happiness and pleasure in glorious eternal lands? This is what Krishna is. This is him actually personifying this ideal that is deep within everybody, which people don't actually realize. Rather than accepting, based on all the authorities and all the acharyas, this ideal of the Supreme Lord, they'd rather fight it because of their silly misconceptions of the mind. In this connection, Lord Chaitanya gave evidence in the Thomas of the very famous verse um, Ishwara Parama Krishna Sachidananda Vikraha Anadir Adir Govinda Sarvakarana Karana. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead with a body full of knowledge, eternality, and bliss. He has no origin. He is the original person known as Govinda and is the cause of all causes. In this way, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave evidence that Krishna is the original Personality of Godhead, full in all six opulences. His abode, known as Goloka Vrindavan, is the highest planet in the spiritual sky. So we know that Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the Supreme Lord himself. So if he's teaching Sanatana Goswami, his word alone is enough. But because he is taking the role of an acharya in our line, he is citing other authorities to um, back up his statements. And here he is citing Lord Brahma. So Lord Brahma is significant because he is considered by um, those who follow the Vedas as being an authority on the Vedas since um, he first received it from the Lord and um, then perpetuated it to his disciples. And also, um, 
he is considered to be practically equal to Lord Vishnu in his role as the creator. And, um, and here, this authority, um, universally accepted authority, is stating that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, stating it quite unequivocally. He is saying that Krishna is the ultimate origin of all. Um, this means that he's the supreme creator of all, since everyone is coming from him, which then, of course, directly challenges the notion that Brahma is the creator. And he is stating that Krishna is the original person. Um, he causes everything and everything to exist, and he has no other cause. Now, when Krishna says that in the Bhagavad Gita, Asamordva, uh, no one is great or equal to him, then people want to challenge that, to say that Krishna is actually referring to the unborn within him. But here, when Lord Brahma is speaking, it, nobody can deny it, of course, being a very authority. And when he is speaking of Krishna, he doesn't indirectly reference him in a way that could be taken as unborn within him. He is stating clearly Govinda, and there's no other Govinda besides our Krishna. He is stating Govinda, the personality of Godhead, not an unborn, not an effulgence, not even the super soul but the personality Govinda, the personality Krishna. And this person, no one can challenge the authority of Brahma in claiming that this person is the supreme personality of God. Even, of course, when um, the Gaudiya um, Vaishnav Acharyas may mention it, um, they get um, um, attacked back with the fact that, as we said earlier, the Srimad Bhagavatam and other devotional literatures are not considered as bad. But here we have this unequivocal stated by a bit authority. So, Lord Chaitanya continues to go even further in establishing the supremacy of the Lord. Already he has made it clear that the Lord is above all the living entities, um, above all the demigods, not just um, the regular rank and file demigods, but even above Lord Brahma, who is considered the creator, and of course the other great demigods like Lord Shiva. But now the Lord. Lord Chaitanya is going even further to explain how Krishna is above um, even his own incarnations and expansions. And he quotes another famous verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 3, Text 28. Ete chamsha kalaha pumsa, Krishna stu bhagavan svayam, indra ridyakalam, lokam radianti yuge yuge. All the incarnations described previously are either direct expansions of Krishna or indirectly expansions of the expansions of Krishna. But Krishna is the original personality of Godhead. He appears on earth, in this universe, or any other universe, when there is disturbance created by the demons who are always trying to disrupt the administration of the demigods. So we have been taught that this is the Parivas Sutra of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So what it means is that um, there would be one verse um, in a holy book that would have the essence of that book um, in that contained just in that verse. And this is the Parivasucha of Bhagavata. And so it contains that essential philosophy that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, that um, all his forms, um, him and all his forms, are delivering the devotees, those that have taken shelter of him through devotional service thus protected by his spiritual energy and he is um, through his various agents destroying the demons who are suffering in this material creation because of not surrendering to Krishna it's the essential philosophy of Krishna consciousness so um, the other important point of our discussion today is that um, all the incarnations and expansions of Krishna although um, so greatly powerful and of course all the supreme Lord are all still originating from Krishna, and he is still supreme within about all of them. So now we're going to touch on the next point of Krishna's supremacy, um, above all the features of the absolute truth. We've discussed previously that Krishna, that there are three um, features um, to the absolute truth. That is, um, the effulgence of the absolute truth, which is the impersonal Brahman. We have the localized aspect of the absolute truth, um, the super soul, the paramatma, and the hearts of every living entity, trafficking in all the atoms of the universe. And then we have the Bhagavan, the actual personality of the Supreme, um, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna. And of course, of all these three forms, um, the conclusion is that Bhagavan is the highest. So um, since we've discussed this at length before, um, we'll go through the scriptural evidences that um, 
Shri Prabhupada and Bhakti Tan give us um, for our own teaching. There are different processes, but there are three different processes by which Krishna can be understood. The empiric process of philosophical speculation, the process of meditation according to the Mystic Yoga system, and the process of Krishna consciousness or devotional service. By philosophical speculation, the impersonal Brahman feature of Krishna is understood. By meditation or mystic yoga, the super soul, the all pervading expansion of Krishna is understood. And by devotional service, full Krishna consciousness, the original personality of Godhead Krishna is realized. In this connection, Lord Chaitanya quotes the first from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 2, Text 11. Those who are knowers of the absolute truth describe the absolute truth in three features the impersonal Brahman, the localized all pervading super soul, and the supreme personality of Godhead Krishna. In other words, Brahman, the impersonal manifestation, Paramatma, the localized manifestation, and Bhagavan, Supreme Personality Godhead, are one and the same. But according to the process adopted, he is realized as Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. By realizing the impersonal Brahman, one simply realizes the effulgence emanating from the transcendental body of Krishna. This effulgence is compared to the sunshine. There is the sun god, the sun itself, and the sunshine, which is the effulgence of that original sun god. Similarly, the spiritual effulgence, the Brahma Jyoti, the impersonal Brahman, is nothing but the personal effulgence of Krishna. To support this analysis, Lord Chaitanya quoted an important verse from the Brahma Samhita, text 40, in which Lord Brahma says, Yasya Prabha Prabhavato Jagaranda Koti Koti Shva Shesha Vashthadi Vitoti Bhinnam Tad Brahma Nishkalam Nantam Shesha Bhutam Govindamadi Purusham Amtajam I worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Govinda, whose personal effulgence is the unlimited Brahma Jyoti. In that Brahma Jyoti, there are innumerable universes, each filled with innumerable planets. So, um, so this Bhakti Shani Maharaj was explaining that uh, this Brahma Jyoti being the effulgence of Krishna is actually colored blue, since Krishna's form is blue. And because um, the material universe is actually situated within the Brahma Jyoti as um, what Brahma is saying here, this is why our material sky is reflecting the color of Krishna. And so if we've ever wondered um, why there's a default color for the sky, it's Krishna. As much as everything else in this universe is all about Krishna, it's just that we don't realize it because of our imperfect senses. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu further explained that the Paramatma, the all-pervading feature situated in everyone's body, is but a partial manifestation or expansion of Krishna. It is for this reason that Krishna is sometimes called Paramatma, the Supreme Self, the Soul of all souls. In this regard, Lord Chaitanya quoted another verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, the 10th canto. While hearing the transcendental pastimes of Krishna and Vrindav, Maharaj Parikshit inquired on the spiritual master, Shukadev Goswami, as to why the inhabitants of Vrindavan are so attached to Krishna. And Shukadev Goswami answered, Krishna should be known as the soul of all souls, for he is the soul of all individual souls and the soul of the localized Paramatma as well. At Vrindavan, he acted just like a human being to attract people to him and show that he is not formless. Thus, the Supreme Lord is as much an individual as all the other living beings, but he is different in that he is the Supreme. All other living beings are subordinate to all other living beings can enjoy spiritual bliss, eternal life, and full knowledge in this association. So all these evidences um, are clearly stating that Krishna is the supreme above even the impersonal Brahman and super soul. Now Lord Chaitanya is explaining how um, Krishna is supreme above Purusha incarnations. So these three Purusha incarnations are described as um, three who are actually one. Um, we know that um, uh, Hinduism commonly refers to Lord Vishnu as the Tena, but he actually has three features, Mahavishnu, uh, Garbhadakshaya Vishnu, Chiradakshaya Vishnu. So they're all carrying out the functions of um, creating and maintaining this material world. Uh, Mahavishnu um, gives rise to all the material universes. Garbhadakshaya Vishnu enters into each universe and then gives rise to all the planetary systems in that universe. He does this because 
the lotus stem that sprouts from his navel is actually containing the planetary systems within that lotus stem. And then um, um, Shiradakshaya Vishnu, the expansion of Garbhadakshaya Vishnu, is the third feature um, of, um, of Vishnu. And he then enters into all these planetary systems, into each um, living entity's um, to your body, and of course into the atoms of everything to maintain it all. So um, we continue. Lord Chaitanya, next Lord Chaitanya quotes the verse from the Bhagavad Gita, which is chapter 10, text 42, in which Krishna, while telling Arjuna of his different opulences, indicates that he himself enters this universe by one of his plenary portions, Garvadakshaya Vishnu, and that and also enters into each universe as Shiradakshaya Vishnu and then expands himself as a super soul in everyone's heart. So that verse that Lord Chaitanya is quoting is Atava Vahunaiti na Kyatin Atavarjuna Vishtabhayam Kitam Kritsnam Ekam Shena Sitojakat. But what need is there, Arjuna, for all this detailed knowledge? With a single fragment of myself, I pervade and support this entire universe. So Krishna is referring to these great and powerful Purusha incarnations as fragments of himself. Um, and they are, of course, Gavadakshaya Vishnu, Chiradakshaya Vishnu. Um, so this entire universe is resting on Gavadakshaya Vishnu. We can't even conceive of what the size of this universe is, what to speak of the great power of Gavadaksha Vishnu, who is actually giving rise to this entire universe from this lotus stem, from his navel. Similarly, we have no conception of how um, Shiva Daksha Vishnu can actually be entering into every atom, every person in creation and maintaining everything. Yet despite these extraordinary great powers from these personalities, they are fragments, portions of portions of Krishna. So we can't even imagine what this offense is. Lord Chaitanya then said that if anyone wants to understand the supreme absolute truth in perfection, he must take to the process of devotional service for Krishna consciousness. Then it will be possible for him to understand the last word of the absolute truth. So this Krishna, this extraordinary, wonderful Krishna, whose appearances on Friday may seem like a sweet young flute player in Srivandavan Dham, but there is no one above them. Not the most powerful living entities in this material world, all the way up to the demigods. Not even his own um, spiritual forms, um, his incarnations, his expansions, the Purushas. Krishna is most supreme above all of them. And he has given us the most supreme process to approach, even though he's so great and so extraordinary that his glories are inconceivable to all of us. We have this process of devotional service, which is the way to approach him. And it's made so simple by um, our beloved Shri Prabhupada. His appearance day is also the Saturday for us to honor. And um, we would be so foolish to not take to these opportunities, um, not only to free ourselves from this material world, but to gain direct association because Srimad Bhagavatam states it's only through this devotional service that we can attain the direct and personal association of this greatest, most extraordinary, most wonderful of all personalities in every creation, both pure and spiritual, our beloved Lord Krishna. Thank you all so much for your kind attention. Um, are there any questions? Any comments, clarifications? Marchi, thank you for the lovely class. Thank you, uh, Bhakti and Shalina Mataji. Mataji, is uh, your questions answered about the topic? I know you said the topic was very interesting, Mataji. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, thank you, Gora Premi Mataji. Um, I think if there's anything that I've learned, uh, you know, it's that uh, we as uh, Kali Yuga specimens, uh, Lord Krishna has made it pretty simple. All we need to do is chant, no rituals. He doesn't expect anything from us. Just chant the holy name. So thank you for that class. Thank you so much for the service. Um, I'd say, though, that I've also been having a realization recently that um, chanting in the association of devotees, so taking the association of devotees to improve and increase and uh, and uh, and 
go deeper into our chanting. It's through the association of devotees and by serving them that uh, that's the actual key to getting um, into the essence of the holy name. And that's how we can make uh, the fastest progress to, to chanting the holy name purely. It's very difficult otherwise. Yes. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. You're actually part of that good association as well. Are there any other questions, comments? Okay, so today we're going to sing a very famous bhajan, um, very sweet, and um, it's about uh, Krishna and Vrindavan. So as we know, we're celebrating the Lord's appearance this weekend, and uh, we encourage everybody to please uh, attend the local um Hare Krishna Center for the programs. The um, festivities generally will start from early in the morning at Mangalarpi, it happens four all the way to the evening at midnight, the time that Krishna appeared. Uh, in Durban, these programs are going to be held in particular at the Shishi Radha Radhana Temple in Chatsworth and at the New Jagannath Puri Temple in Phoenix. Please, everybody, do attend. Um, search in your heart for something personal that you can do or offer to Krishna. Um, especially, of course, like Matthew mentioned, chanting his holy names with love. Um, and then on Saturday is the appearance day of our beloved Shri Prabhupada, who brought Krishna, brought Chaitanya, and his devotional service to us. And um, the, the festivities for Shri Prabhupada's appearance day are also going to be um, observed from the early morning from Mangal Arati on Saturday till about midday, where um, the big feast in his honor will be served. So once again, please attend these programs and uh, you know, for your heart, the Shura Prabhupada in gratitude. So this bhajan is actually um, by uh, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, called Jai Radha, Jai Krishna, Jai Vrindavan. This is a bit long. I'm not going to sing it to the chorus. Um, Jai Radhe, Jai Krishna. Jaya Vrindavan Thank 
All glories, all glories to all of the visitors of the dove. All glories to the wives of the proud daily brothers. All glories to the wives of the Kaliasa. Through pure devotion, they all obtained the lotus feet of the Govita. All glories to the place where the rasa dance of Sri Krishna was performed. All glories to Radha and Shan. All glories, all glories to the divine rasa dance, which is the most beautiful of all of Krishna's pastimes. All glories, all glories to the hello of conjugal love, which is the most excellent of all rasas and is propagated in Raja by Sri Krishna in the form of the divine Paravriya Pava, Paramola. Remembering the low speak of Lord Nityananda's consort, Sri Janaka Dev, this very fallen and holy servant of Krishna sings the Santirkan Bodhi. Sri Sri Radha Dhanati Vijay, Sri Sri Gurhari Vijay, Sri Rakabhupada Vijay, Sri Sri Gurhari this is a very nice meditation on the most wonderful, glorious, holy land of Srivantavadam where Krishna appeared um, in order to display his wonderful pastimes and reclaim us by capturing our attention and our love um, for his forms, his names, his qualities, his pastimes, his associates, all his transcendental paraphernalia and his holy dham. So may these be our meditations this week and always. Um, thank you all so much for your kind attention. Um, we're going to continue next week um, with Chapter 6, uh, the continuation of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teaching of Swami Goswami. Please do join us. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, thank you. Hare Krishna, thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna, thank you all so much.